this morning, David Vuren. Let's give him a round of applause. Uh, Dave's amazing. Very, very similar build to me. Um, something I aspire to. Let's just, let's just pray for Dave this morning. Lord, thank you, da- uh, thank you for Dave, Lord. Thank you so much for uh, the man of God he is. Lord, thank you for the word that he has this morning for us. Lord, may you just speak through him. May he be a vessel for you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, Andy. Um, I want to take this opportunity just to, to thank you, church, and the worship team for that extraordinary worship today. You guys rock. You really do. So I had an interesting week. <clears throat> um, Sue and I were entertaining 400 guests in, in Belgium over a four-day period. Um, and when, when Nigel emailed me a few weeks ago to say, Dave, would you speak on, on, on this day? I knew that I'd only be getting back from, from this event this week. And, but instantly, because we were talking about the kingdom of God, I said to Nigel, I'm in. Because there's nothing better than to speak about the kingdom of God and the kingdom of God come here now. So um, Sue and I were away this whole week, and uh, over the last few months, Sue's really been nurturing a, a little garden at our, our new home, and obviously there was no rain. And um, we, we got home on Friday evening, and Saturday morning I woke up, and I, I walked outside into the garden, and the garden was really, really dry, so like a good husband, I got the hose pipe out, and I started watering the garden really, really well. And just as I was finishing watering the garden, I looked over the fence, and I saw my neighbor's daughter, Angelina, and she was just filling in a, a hole. Um, in the garden, and um, I, I looked and I said, good morning, Angelina, what are you doing? And she looked up and she had tears on her face, and she's quite sad, and I said, what's going on? She said, no, my goldfish died, and I'm burying my goldfish, and then she like put the spade down, and, and I looked at it, and I said, but Angelina, that's a, a very big hole for a goldfish, and she said, yes, but it was inside the cat. Got you guys. <laughs> you didn't expect that, did you? Okay, let's talk about the kingdom of God. The, um, the kingdom of God is really big, is the headline. Okay. Um, but I've always, I've always loved this idea of thinking about the upside down kingdom of God and, and what that might look like. And today I, I do want to talk about gardening. Um, I want to talk about the love of God as as a father on Father's Day. But if you think about the kingdom of God and the upside down kingdom of God, there's, you know, in in, in, um, the Sermon on the Mount, you know, Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn and blessed are those who hunger. And blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness and blessed are you when people insult you in my name. You know, that's the upside down kingdom of God. But even now, you know, is love your enemy. Doesn't that just freak you out? When Jesus says to you, love your enemy. Or something along the lines of, let the first be last. This upside down kingdom of God turns everything that we think is right the wrong way around. So I'm going to try and talk about that a little bit. We... We talk about um, your kingdom come. We pray that prayer, God, your kingdom come. You know, it's, it's probably the first prayer I, um, I learned as a Christian. And uh, the last few years, I've really, really, whenever I pray, I just keep praying, is God, your kingdom come here in this place. Because we want heaven on earth. We want heaven to come down on earth. And, and you know, in the idea of trying to work out what that might look like here on earth, I, I kind of think about some of the stories that we read in Scripture, the you know, think about the Israelites leaving Egypt, going through the desert, and being pursued by the Egyptians. And then all of a sudden you come to the sea, and you go, okay, we're done for. And then something happens, and there's just walls of water either side, and you can walk straight through the middle. The wonder that might have been there, you know, if you were one of those Israelites looking to the left and to the right, you're kind of going like, wow. What's God doing? You know, or Jesus turning water into wine at a party. Think about if you were at that party and, you know, you, 
You've been getting your boogie on. We did quite a lot of that this week. Um, and at the end of the party, someone brings you a glass of wine, and it's just extraordinary. Or you were one of the servants who took the water and then started serving the wine. How your brain might have just been fried when you poured it out and it wasn't water anymore, it was wine. Or what about Peter sitting on a boat in a storm, terrified, and you see a ghost and then realize it's Jesus, and he's walking on the water. And then you kind of go, hey, can I do that? And you get out and you start walking on water. The kingdom of God has come there to these people in this place. You see, the kingdom of God is all about God's reign. We've been hearing that over the last few weeks. It's all about God's reign yeah, on earth. Um, I'm going to try and multitask here more than one hand at a time. You know, so the, it's all about God's reign here on earth. So that's what would have happened to those people, you know, the, the Israelites or Peter on the boat or the servants at the party. They would have realized the kingdom of God has come near them. You know, how are we thinking about that day to day? How are you thinking about the kingdom of God coming near you day to day? You know, we sang that song, it's your breath in our lungs. In the morning when you wake up, you kind of go, hey God, you gave me this breath. You reign in my life and in my heart. You know, are we thinking like that? In scripture, Jesus talks to us. He, he tells us some of this stuff. He says, once on being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied, the coming of the kingdom of God is not something that can be observed, nor will people say, here it is, or there it is, because the kingdom of God is in your midst. The kingdom of God is in your midst. You see, that's the reign of God. Yeah, with us now. Or in Mark, when Jesus says, the time has come, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. You guys are in a vineyard church. You've heard the good news. Yeah, many, many many times the kingdom of God has come near I want to um, talk about the parables I know we've been going through last week Joe did uh, four parables from Matthew 13 I'm going to be looking at uh, one of the parables in Matthew 13 too but before I go into to the parables just to, to give you a heads up that, that the parables were spoken by Jesus but when he speaks these parables and tells these parables, he would have been speaking to a bunch of people who would have been able to hear what he was saying based on something in the Old Testament, as an example. There was a reference for those parables. There's a bunch of parables in the Old Testament, if you didn't know. There's a bunch of parables in the Old Testament. But it's kind of similar to us now, that if I give you guys a, a quote from a film, you would know it. If I go, may the force be with you. Star Wars. Okay, well done. Okay. Slightly to the older folk. There's no place like home. The <laughs> Wizard of Oz. Well done. Elementary, my dear Watson. I love Sherlock Holmes. Don't you guys love Sherlock Holmes? Okay, what about my mama always said life was like a box of chocolates? Forest Gump. Has everyone seen Forrest Gump? Who has, you know my girls have not seen Forrest Gump? That's being a bad dad, right? You guys have not seen Forrest Gump? Hey, la la. My personal favorite, I'll be back. The Terminator, right? The Terminator. Okay, so Matthew 13 has uh, the blue doesn't work well on, the, on that, sorry. Matthew 13 has seven parables in it. I'll just call them. So, parable of the sower, parable of the weeds, parable of the mustard seed, of the leaven, of the hidden treasure, the parable of the pearl, and the parable of the drawing in of the net. And in each one of those, they're all in 
Matthew 13. Jesus is talking about the kingdom of heaven somehow. In the parable of the sower, he's talking about the kingdom of heaven and the knowledge of the kingdom of heaven. But before we go to the, the parable, let's have a look at one that's really, you know, when, I, when I read the title of this parable in Isaiah 5, the, the song of the vineyard. Maybe this is a song for us. Maybe there's something in this for us. I don't know. You know? I will sing for the one I love a song about the vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. I'm going to pause because I want to speak about the Father heart of God. If we can read this knowing that God cares for us and recognizes us and wants to love us and wants to do something good for us. This is what God does for us before we mess it up. So I'll start again. I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleared it of stones and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut out a wine press as well. Then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded bad fruit. You know, in those two verses, we're seeing a father prepare a vineyard. He's getting rid of all the stones, all the thorns and all the briars. He's putting a watchtower and a press there for us. That's the father heart of God. Now you dwellers in Jerusalem and people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done for my vineyard than I have done for it? When I looked for good grapes, why did it yield bad? Now I will tell you what I'm going to do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge and it will be destroyed. I will break down its wall and it will be trampled. I will make it a wasteland neither pruned nor cultivated and briars and thorns will grow there. I will command the clouds not to rain on it. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the nation of Israel. And the people of Judah are the vines he delighted in and looked for justice, but saw bloodshed for righteousness, but heard cries of distress. You know, in, in Isaiah, there's a whole lot of highs and lows, right? And, and in, in this parable in the Old Testament, I just think that you see God's heart for Israel and God wanting to bless those people and to set them in a place where they had, like, success. And I think that that's God's heart for us, that God wants to set us in a place. You know, in, in Psalm 18, there's a, there's, there's a section in Psalm 18 where God draws people out of an entanglement, you know, in the depths of despair, and he places them in a place of rest where they can have restoration. And if, if that's you, I just want you to recognize that God will do that. God will draw you out of that place of despair and desperation and set you in a place where there's an opportunity for you to rest, restore, and actually just breathe. Breathe in the breath of God. You know, as I'm speaking, I really believe that's for someone here today. Is God wants you to know that he's able to draw you out of that place of despair, set you in a place of rest, and restore you. I'm going to look at the parable of the sower, um, and let's, let's go through this. Everybody knows this, right? Well, most of us do. Who's never heard the parable of the sower? Okay, so you guys have all heard the parable of the sower. So I'm going to, I'm going to look at it in a slightly different way today, maybe. Um, I don't know. We'll find out in a minute. But let's go through it. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. <laughs> Again, you know, it's like this humanity of Jesus. He had a busy, busy day, and he goes out of the house, and he's just sitting by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it while all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell on the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on the rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly 
because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no roots. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop, a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let him hear. So, in this, in the scripture, I've, I've really tuned into the idea of, of Andy, soil. When, when I said that I was going to talk about soil today, uh, Andy didn't understand me. So the ground, dust, clay, mud, soil, the stuff you dig in when you plant plants. I want to talk about the soil. What's important about soil? If we go right back to the beginning of, of scripture, Adam was made out of the dust, the Adama. Out of the dust, God formed Adam and breathed into him. Out of the dust, with God's breath, comes life. You see, we are made out of soil. We come from soil. Our hearts are that soil, the Adama. Adam and Eve were made out of the soil, and they were put in the garden to look after the garden, to look after the soil. They were instructed to, to make sure that produce grew there, to look after it, to work it. That was their job. And when Adam and Eve died, they were put back in the soil and returned back to the soil. The Adama. You see, that Adama is in us. God made us out of the soil and he breathed his life in us. And we have a role to play in terms of how we're looking after that soil. You know, even Jesus was put in the soil when he died, wasn't he? You know, if you think about it, he's put in the cave and the door was closed and he came out of there back to life. So the soil is really important. But Matthew 13 carries on. It goes on. Let me do this. I'm not used to using this clicker thing. But blessed are your eyes because they see and your hearts because they hear. The idea that you hear this morning you're blessed. Well done for making it here today. You've received the blessing. For truly I tell you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see, but did not see it. And to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom, and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in their heart. The seed sown along the path. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time when trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. How many of, them, of us does that relate to? The worries of this world just comes and robs the joy of God away from us. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. So in there, Jesus gives an outline of what the parable means. You know, the idea that stuff just gets in the way of the word of God, which is the seed in the parable, going into our hearts, which is the soil. I'm going to tell you a story, maybe to, to help you. 
there was a man, he was, he was a good man. He had two sons and uh, he wasn't well. And on his deathbed, he said to his two sons, my boys, I've, I've buried a treasure in the field, but I really cannot remember where that treasure is. It's, it's no deeper than 18 inches below the surface. I buried it there, but I, I can't remember where it is. The man died. The boys buried their father and decided that they were going to look for treasure in the field. And they started digging one day, just digging, digging, digging around the field, looking for the treasure. Days went by and weeks went by and they could not find the treasure. But taking a look and realizing that they'd done so much work and, and that the effort was great, they decided to sow a crop. And they sowed a crop and in the right season, they reaped a harvest. In the autumn, they decided they were going to look for the treasure again. So the two boys went out and they dug up the field again, looking for the treasure, spending days and weeks digging, looking for the treasure. They didn't find it. But again, recognizing their effort, they decided, well, let's sow some seeds which they did. And again, in the right season, they reaped a bountiful heart, harvest. And this pattern repeated itself each year. In the autumn, the boys would go out, they'd dig up the field looking for the treasure with the hope that they'd find the treasure. And each year, after digging up the field, they'd sow seed, plant a harvest, and, and harvest. And, and what happened was they became famous. You know, their, their produce was better than anyone else's in the whole region. It was bountiful each year. And as the boys grew older, they realized that what their father was talking to them about was the treasure of hard work. The idea that out of hard work, you can reap a reward. And I think in this parable of of the sower, or maybe what it could possibly be called is the parable of the soils. Many of the commentators call it the parable of the soils. Is, is the idea of hard work and what that hard work might look like for you and for me in terms of our knowledge of the kingdom of God. Because that's what Jesus is asking us to do. He's asking us to work on our soil. You know, make sure that you turn over that fallow ground so that the seed's not taken away by the birds or to get rid of the weeds. In Jeremiah, in Jeremiah chapter four, verse three, it says, do not sow amongst the briars. Make sure you remove the weeds from your soil. Get rid of the rocks, like in Isaiah five. Take those rocks and build a wall around your field. You see, it's work. Being a Christian is not easy. It requires work. It requires us feeding into the kingdom of God every day. We pray the prayer, our Father in heaven, your kingdom come. Give us today our daily bread. That's you going, you know, to God, please God, I need more of you today. And then receiving from him and going and doing it. Actively doing something. You know, whether that's you just being kind to someone, you know, in the, in the shopping center or at, in a store or, you know, cutting your neighbor's grass. Okay, it's dry now, so it would be a bad idea. But, but, but doing something that's really lovely for someone else, which they just really didn't expect. What about it being along the lines of where you recognize that you've got the gifts of the Holy Spirit, but you're not working in them? You know, we've, we've come out of Pentecost a few weeks ago. And the Spirit of God has been given to us that we may have gifts and blessings that we can bless other people in the name of Christ. Are you working? Or are you just allowing the ground to lay fallow? You see, because if you allow the ground to lay fallow, the outcome is what you read in Isaiah 5. 
God begins to take away some of the gifts and the blessings. You'll read that in the, the parable of the talents too. It's a harsh one. It's full on. In the same parable, Jesus uses the word here 13 times. When something gets repeated that frequently, perhaps we need to pay attention. Are you hearing what Jesus is saying in this parable? That the kingdom of God is coming near you. There's a, an exposition that's uh, from Barnes Study Notes in the Bible, and I couldn't find a better way to describe what it means to hear and understand the word of God as Jesus would like us to do. It goes like this, and man, it's so good. Those whose hearts are prepared by grace to receive it honestly and to give it full opportunity to grow in a rich and mellow soil, in a heart that submits itself to the full influence of truth, unchecked by cares and anxieties, under the showers and summer suns of divine grace. I love that bit. Under the showers and summer suns of divine grace. <laughs> we were worshiping earlier on, and I'm just kind of going, Lord, let your rain come. Pour down your rain on us, Lord. With the heart spread open, like a broad, luxuriant field, to the rays of the morning and to the evening dews, the gospel takes deep root and grows. It has full room, and then and there only shows what it is. It's glorious, that. But again, it's talking about an act of life. It's talking about us engaging in our soil, in our hearts. You know, for me, you know, that, that bit about sun and showers, to me what that speaks of is actually I need to be making sure that I'm spending time in God's word and that I'm receiving God's word as that sunshine and that, 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 that shower that I need to grow. It's an active thing that Jesus is looking for. He wants us to engage in him, in the Father, in the Spirit, is what he's looking for. Make sure you're spending time growing in the Spirit of God. The I can becomes an I must. There's a, there's a a guy I really enjoy, his name's Erwin McManus, and uh, many years ago I, I read a book of his about courageous faith, and, and ever since then I've, I've followed him, and I, I follow him on Instagram, and, and last week on, on Instagram he said this, we need to be in a place where the I can becomes an I must. You know, in, in my thoughts of this parable of the soils, I've been thinking about what that might look like. You guys are, uh, are Christians, you're in church on a Sunday, you've given your time here. So you have this recognition and the understanding that I can operate in the gifts of the Spirit. I can live a life sold out for Christ. I can do so many things. But I think the thing that I'm asking today is that we move that I can to I must. I must move in the power of the Spirit. I must live a kingdom-filled life. That's what God's calling us to through the parable of the soils, is that we recognize that we go from I can to I must. And if I'm speaking to you today, I think that, you know, JJ, I'm not sure if you guys are coming up again or how we're closing, but I'd love to pray for people. You know, is, is the idea that we're moving from I can to I must. You know, Pentecost was a few weeks ago, and you may not have got an opportunity to come up for prayer for the, 
you know, for the gifts of the Spirit. And if you feel like that's something that you would like to receive or get, or, or just if you want to come up today to have courage to move in a place in your life where you go from I can to I must, if whilst I've been speaking today there's this recognition of, yeah, I can, but I haven't, but I must, I'd love to pray for you. I don't know how you want to close, Joe, Andy. You know, so if that's for you, we'll have an opportunity for prayer in a minute. Joe, Joe, uh, come on. Yeah, you guys are going to come up? And if it's possible, if you guys could pray that it's your breath. Yeah? Because the idea that we are Adama, we are formed out of the dust. And the breath of God is inside us. And it's that breath that's inside us that causes us to sing God's praises. I think that's really important. So if, you, if you're feeling like what Dave said about that, I can to I must, then please do come forward for prayer.